All right, so it is seven o'clock, so I am gonna go ahead and get started. Um, for those who are with us remotely, I just wanna remind everybody to mute your phones uh, so that we don't have uh, unnecessary distractions. Um, and with that, I'm very excited to introduce Sean Reynolds. He's our visiting professor from the University of Utah. Um, uh, so Dr. Reynolds did his uh, residency training at the University of Utah. He then worked for a couple of years in private practice. He uh, uh, subsequently went to the UK and did a cardiac anesthesia fellowship at Cambridge University, returned to Utah for a handful of years, and then spent three years in Africa, uh, splitting time between Guinea and Rwanda um, uh, before returning to Utah. Um, at that time- Recording in progress. At that time, he uh, uh, founded and is, the CEO of a company called Through the Cords, which uh, creates uh, airway management devices that can be used both in the developing and the, the uh, developed world to uh, save lives in our, our often our most critical um, situations. Um, so with that, um, Dr. Reynolds is gonna be talking sustainable impact at scale, and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, and it's nice to meet you all. Thank you, Dr. Zavara, for inviting me, and thanks, um, Dr. Flynn for inviting me and making all this happen. So I've got a fairly non-linear, non-traditional pathway to where I am now. Um, what I'm going to do today is, uh, it, this is a narrative style lecture, so it's, it's I'm going to paint a broad picture. There's a lot of things that I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but this is not um, a lecture where I you know have three objectives and I want you guys to be able to regurgitate the objectives at the end. Um, so idea is to, to um, give you a little bit of insight into the personal journey um, that I've had to get to where I am. Um, we're going to talk about drivers of innovation and then pathways to sustainable impact at scale. Um, I would imagine most of us went into medicine because we want to have uh, positive social impact. Um, and academics want, you know, stay in medicine often because they want to have impact at scale. And so we train residents and it's always nice, you know, 10 years on when a resident says something that you said to them to another medical student or resident, and then you realize you had some impact. Um, we're going to talk about a model for intubation. Um, combined technique, also known as hybrid technique for intubation in Europe. Um, and then return on some business things, return on investment, um, why pediatrics always comes last, and then talk about business outcomes and clinical outcomes. So I'm going to try to mix a little bit um, here. Uh, okay, so disclosures, I'm the inventor of the TCI Dynamic Introducer. Um, I'm also the CEO of, of the company that produces that, that's ttcmed.com. Um, I'm co-director of the ASA Fair um, Swimming with Sharks contest. Anybody who's interested in that is, um, is always, uh, always welcome to contact me. Um, my biases are that access to safe intubation should be available in all medical systems, period, end of story. The gap between academic projects and commercial products is a real and costly unsolved problem. We are not having enough of our ideas getting out um, into the world and, and uh, creating sustainable impact at scale. Um, so 2013, I, took a, I started a three-year sabbatical working in, um, in Guinea, and I worked for Mercy Ships, which is a surgical hospital ship. There's 90 ward beds and 60, or six operating rooms, and uh, you're there for a year. You take care of loads and loads of patients and do really complex surgery. Um, it is a modern and first world surgical environment on the ship. So you're effectively pulling a first world hospital up to a third world and uh, maybe even a fourth world um, country. And then you're able to produce really high quality outcomes and, and do complex cases. So uh, my personal pain point was uh, these were the airway cases we were doing. We were doing a lot of advanced tumors, um, a lot of reconstructive work burns, um, a very difficult and challenging airway management. I was a continuity anesthesiologist on the ship, so I was there the entire year. Everybody else was coming for two to four weeks at a time, mostly two weeks at a time, 
I didn't know them. They were from many different cultures, many different countries. Everybody was board certified. I get learned a lot, but it was a pressure cooker of a situation. People would come, they would be off cycle on their time coming from Europe or coming from the States mostly or, um, or Russia. And, um, and so they were jet lagged. They would arrive, they were disoriented, they were on a ship, they were in an unfamiliar anesthetic environment, and then they would face a case like this. And so what do people do? What do we all do when we're nervous in the OR about an airway? We do awake fiber optics. And um, it turns out awake fiber optics are uh, difficult to do. They're slow, they're inconsistent in outcomes. Sometimes it's in in eight minutes, sometimes it's in in an hour. Sometimes you wake the patient up because you couldn't get it in. Um, it's a complex procedure requiring complex equipment, needs a lot of tech support. Um, you really feel that when you're on a ship in Guinea and the closest place that can fix your fiber optic bronchoscope is in France. Um, needs two skilled providers and it's really hard and it's stressful and that's not only for the provider um, but also for the patient. It turns out most Anesthesia providers avoid fiber optics. We don't do enough awake intubations because we associate the fiber optic scope with the only way to uh, intubate a patient awake, which is not true. Um, and so we avoid them and we end up with more crikes and more um, disasters than we'd like. The, the British are well aware of this. And if you read the NAP4 was their you know, magisterial report on um, complications, airway complications. I'd encourage everybody to read that, but it is a novel. <laughs> it's like 300 and some odd pages long. So, innovation. Um, Abu Bakar is a kid who had a big mid-face defect, and that's an Abbey flap. So you take the bottom lip and sew it to the top, and the kid has his mouth sewn shut for about six weeks while the flap... Um, vascularizes and then you go back and cut the pedicle. In the meantime, you need to intubate him two or three times to, uh, to debride the flap. And so that was my challenge. We had a broken fiber optic scope that was in France getting repaired. I really couldn't delay the case. And so what do I do? And um, so what I did was I put a video laryngoscope with a hyperangulated blade in one side of the flap and then I drove an ambuscope in the other, and we had beautiful ambuscopes, um, but like a lot of great charity donations, we didn't get the screen. So all we had was ambuscopes without screens. And that uh, allows a directable stylet. You know, you just basically use it as a, as a dynamic or a directable stylet. And so your visualization is coming from the video laryngoscope, and your tracheal access is coming from the, uh, the dynamic stylet. And so... This is a patient um, with a big amelioblastoma, and that became the standard way we did the intubations um, on the ship. So this is a video laryngoscope going in, and um, patients asleep because Afri our African patients didn't tolerate awake very well. They were terrified. And then in the nose goes the ambuscope, and what you'll see is as soon as you have something you can maneuver in the airway, um, things become very easy and intuitive. And so that went from a really complex airway with a fiber optic scope um, to now we can direct the tip of this wherever we want to go. And you can ask yourself the question, how are we 20 years on with the video laryngoscope and we're using bent metal rods? Like I don't like doing rigid bronchs um, because rigid, it just makes me feel like we're, we're, uh, you know, move, we're putting too much force on tissue when we do a rigid bronch, but that's essentially what we're, we're stuck with now is those rigid stylets. And so once you're in the trachea, you've created a secure route. Um, there's very little bleeding because you're using a very small, um, small introducer through the nose, and then the tube can be railroaded in, and uh, it's very safe, very easy. And this is a one, two, three learning curve. So that was Dr. Christian. Um, I did this one, he did the next one, and, um, and then he was off to the races and I could be somewhere else. So if you can see with the video laryngoscope, in general, you can get there if you have a dynamic introducer. So more pain at scale. My next two years were in Rwanda, and this was a very different program. This was capacity building, so I was working for the National University of Rwanda. It was a big program. 
Um, and we had residents and um, it was a full, uh, somebody else's healthcare system and I was working in it. So austerity lays bare and clarifies problems. So crisis and austerity um, uncovers and puts problems in sharp relief and you really can start to understand what's going on in your system. We all saw that with COVID. So airway management in Rwanda, um, we had non-anesthesiologists providing most of the care. So they were anesthesia technicians, finished high school and got two to three years of training and then were providing care um, largely unsupervised and unsupported. Um, DL was the routine approach to, diff, uh, to airways. And then VL was available. We had video laryngoscopes available at all of our tertiary care centers. Um, and those were reserved for expected and unexpected difficult intubations. And there was no fiber optic um, scopes available. So that sounds a lot like a lot of our surgery centers here. Um, we had three airway disasters in the first three months I was there. Um, and that rolls out to about one in 300, and that's consistent with the literature um, in the developing world for, for airway management. Now, to contrast that, we have about one in 40,000 to one in 50,000 here in the United States and in, in uh, first world countries. So um, all the deaths, all three of those de deaths involved a video laryngoscope being used at generally as a rescue device, and they achieved a view that was adequate but they had difficult tracheal access and persistent attempts at tracheal access. And for the residents in the room, the number one um, thing to understand about intubation is people don't die because we can't intubate them. They die because we failed to stop trying to intubate them. And you can think about that later today but when you start to intubate somebody. So um, VL did not look like a magic bullet to me. It looked like just a simple bullet to the chest of these patients was not achieving what we hoped it would achieve. And largely, um, again, that's uncovered. That's what we see in the states. When we look at closed claims, um, since the video laryngoscope has been introduced as a rescue device, we have the same number of airway disasters, but the outcomes are getting worse. More people are dying from them. And I think that's probably because if you can see, we, we tend to keep trying. So the closer to death, the greater the drive. Wars drive loads of innovation. And if you're in a personal situation where you're seeing people die pretty frequently, you want to solve the problem. So I'm going to give you, like all good academics, um, you got to have a model. What's the underlying principles or what's the underlying model? So we don't have a good model for intubation. We do it. We all know how to do it. But if you ask, 10 different academics, you'll get 10 different models about what intubation is. So the model I use is it's a process in general. Um, it's a system of three components. We're solving a geometry problem. And then we're going to talk about dynamic versus static tracheal access. So intubation is a process. You know, first we visualize the glottis and then we access the trachea. And that seems very obvious, but if you read your notes, um, that's not the way we're often describing things. We just say, I couldn't intubate with a video laryngoscope. And that's kind of like when my wife says, be nicer to me, terrifying. If you can tell me what nice is, I'll do it. I want to be nice to my wife, but if I don't have an idea of what the process or the components are, I'm in deep, deep trouble. So intubation is a system. I think of intubation as a system. There's three components. There's visualization equipment, there's tracheal access equipment, and there's an operator. So geometry problem. Sure uh, Greenberg is a gentleman from, from uh, he's a Kiwi from New Zealand, and he described uh, the airway in 2010 as two curves, a primary curve, a secondary curve. The inflection point between those curves is at the glottis, and so the key points are two curves, opposite directions, inflection point at the glottis, and this is serpentine geometry. So that's the natural airway. Okay, and I'm going to use this icon here to denote the serpentine geometry and the two curves of the natural airway. Okay, and I'm going to wrap all of this in an evolutionary framework for you with the hopes that that can help you start to understand why we struggle. 
So we're going to talk about visualization components and access components and the co-evolution over time. So 1940 is when we started to intubate people regularly. Um, that was a direct laryngoscope. Um, hasn't changed much. That's the beginning of the DL era. K-tracheal access was static, is static, rigible, rigid stylets or malleable stylets, bougies. But the key thing is you can't change their shape while in use. Okay, so that's the static access era. And why did we fail during that era? Essentially what we're doing is we're lining up our eye, it's line of sight with the trachea, and that means everything's linear. Okay, so tracheal access geometry is linear. So what's the model we use? 1944, Bannister developed the three axes model. Is everybody being taught that now? Okay, that model's from 1944, and it's consistent and uh, pretty high fidelity, maybe, for um, direct laryngoscopy. Makes no sense at all for video laryngoscopy. So uh, Greenland introduced the two-curve theory, and I think that's a model, that's the model that I um, shared for Journal Club yesterday, and it's, it's worth a read. Needs to be disseminated and taught. Um, so, oh, no. Let me see here. There we go. Okay, so what are we doing with direct laryngoscopy if we think about Greenland? We're actually flattening those curves. So we put the, the blade in, it flattens the first curve, and then we lift the jaw, and that flattens that second curve. So we now have a linear pathway all the way down to the carina. Okay, so our system, our DL era system, visualization equipment flattens curves. Tracheal access equipment is static because if it's line of sight, we really don't need to be moving around to get through a, 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 a straight pathway. Single operator. So back to our, um, back to our uh, intubation um, co-evolution. Failure of visualization is why we fail. With the, when we fail to intubate with DL, it's a failure of visualization. If you can't see, I hope you're not just poking around and trying to blindly intubate. That's generally considered bad. Um, and so tracheal access really wasn't thought about. The hive mind doesn't know much about tracheal access. Our understanding of intubation is organized around visualization because that's why we were failing. Um, we don't have a tracheal access scale or a classification system. We have a great classification system for visualization. And so that just shows we don't study it. We don't know about it. Um, we don't know much about it. So failure of visualization, that drove innovation, and we got the video laryngoscope. And that has essentially solved our visualization problems. Um, it's very, very rare that we put a video laryngoscope in somebody and we can't see at least the posterior structures of the glottis. That began the VL era. So you'll notice the video laryngoscope is the same shape as that primary curve. That's not an accident. Okay, and we get this great panoramic and stable view of the glottis. Other people can share that view with us. Okay, now the consequence is um, we don't flatten those curves anymore. And so tracheal access has changed. Tracheal access needs to take place around this serpentine pathway. So now we're going to have to add geometry into our timeline because tracheal access geometry has actually changed. So geometry for um, the DL era was linear. For the VL era, now it's serpentine. Now, we do have some evolution in our tracheal access timeline, and that's the rigid stylet that we're all familiar with, and that, but it is still static. And that solves the first curve. You'll notice that that is um, the same shape as the primary curve. But we still have to solve the inflection point, and we still have to solve the second curve. So how do we solve that? Rigid static stylets, their characteristics, they're the shape of the curve cannot be changed while in use. It's a single anterior curve, solves the primary curve only, and we're solving 
It does not solve the inflection point or the secondary curve. How do we solve those? Um, we force the ET tube tip, tube tip posterior with anterior glottis and anterior trachea. And when you use a video laryngoscope today, think about that as you're using it. And as a general rule in um, medicine, we don't want to use patient's tissue to shape our tools or to force our tools where we want to be. We want to be gentle to human tissue. Ask your surgeons. Um, they don't want to put force on tissue. They want to be gentle to human tissue. So what's that look like? Um, everybody's seen this. I won't play it for too long because it uh, hurts me. But this is it, that anterior curve. Okay, and you can see what, what's happening in this case with the glottic structures. They're being moved all over the place. A lot of force. And then the stylet comes out, and, um, and we still have to turn it in a secondary fashion. Now, this patient's not, not relaxed. This is pulled off of uh, YouTube. Um, and then you start twisting the turn. Now, anybody who's used the video laryngoscope a lot um, has done that exact same maneuver and encountered that. Um, arguably, the, the human vocal cords are some of the most delicate structures in the body. Um, so how about results, VL versus DL? This is a Cochrane review from, from 2016. Absolutely sure that we've improved the glottic view with video laryngoscopy. It may reduce laryngeal airway trauma, it may not. Um, reduces the number of failed intubations, but currently in 2016, there was no evidence indicating that the use of a video laryngoscope reduced the number of intubation attempts. Now, we just assumed that it did because we could see, and the hive mind was all about seeing. So if you solve that problem, then you should get better clinical results. But there's not a lot of evidence that we've got better clinical results. So 2002, um, that Cochrane review was updated with more data. Um, and it just was published like a month ago. I'd encourage everybody to take a look at it. Um, again, improved glottic view, no question. It may improve first pass success, but that's not a very strong signal. Um, probably reduces the number of failed intubations, and these are straight out of the, uh, the uh, conclusions of the authors. Um, and then it's silent on the number of intubation uh, of attempts to intubate. So they didn't say anything about that. If they didn't say anything about it, my guess is they didn't see evidence for it. Um, so how about rescue intubations after failed DL? This was a big study done by um, Aziz, okay? And these are the different types of, uh, of approaches after a failed DL that, that are being used. Um, the, the most popular approach these days is a video laryngoscope. And so the important thing is they got pretty good results, 92% um, success rate, 8% fail, failure rate, that's pretty good for a rescue. That's as good as it gets. Um, nearly one in 10 rescues after DL fail. Okay, so I'd like to just think of it in that case. If you're walking into a bad situation, you wanna do better than, than, um, than nine out of 10. You wanna have something with more consistent results. Okay, why do, they, why do uh, VL era intubations fail? If you look at the secondary data of some of these big studies, 76% of the time it is not visualization, it's tracheal access problems. So we're gonna break this down just a little bit quickly. Overall success rate for different types of video laryngoscopes, and these patients were in hard collars. So they simulated a difficult airway, limited mouth opening, limited neck movement, and 98% uh, success rate with the video laryngoscope, 92 with the glide scope, 98 with the McGrath, okay? And then we get to quality of view, visualization, poor views, you know, two, two, and one. So very, very infrequently did they get a bad view. Um, ease of tube insertion. So fair to poor probably means, poor means they're struggling, fair probably means they're struggling. You've got excellent and good. So if you look at the fair and poor, you know, you've got big numbers here. And so this is 360 of the patients. The other patients were channeled video laryngoscopes. Um, poor view 1.3% of the time and fair or poor, poor tracheal access 75% of the time. So we've essentially traded with video laryngoscopy 
we've traded difficult visualization for more difficult tracheal access. And I think that's why we aren't seeing the clinical outcomes we'd like to see with video laryngoscopes. So back to our system. Remember, intubation is a system of three components. And so now our visual is a single operator, right? Visualization equipment is a video laryngoscope. Tracheal access is static. That's where we stand today. So training to expertise, um, the most expensive way to fix a problem is to train people. Um, for you residents here, you're extremely expensive and valuable because we're spending a lot of time training you. Having everybody in this room right now is very expensive. Those ORs are not generating revenue and we're gonna, we're gonna pay you guys anyway. That's the way our system works. So visualization equipment, um, if you're using a direct laryngoscope, 150 to 200 intubations to get to a, a acceptable level, level of mastery. Video laryngoscope, five to 10 intubations. So that's a big drop in training to master the uh, visualization side of our, of our um, equation. Tracheal access, bougies. Everybody's used a bougie. We really haven't studied the learning curves on bougies, but my um, anecdotal experience is it's pretty easy to use a bougie. So not much training involved. Um, teaching a resident to uh, use or an EM, EMS provider to use a rigid stylet actually takes quite a few. Again, we have not studied this, so we don't know, but anecdotally that seems to be where the tips and tricks come in to consistently get that tube into the trachea. So again, the most expensive solution to a problem is more training. Rwanda had 16 million people in it. Um, anesthesia technicians take three years to train. If we can solve intubation problems there, maybe we can use anesthesia technicians to service um, Rwanda. Anesthesiologists in that system took six years of medical school and four years of, um, of anesthesia training after that. We did a back of the envelope calculation because those were the two systems that the ministry was testing um, to meet the needs of Rwandan anesthesia um, providers. 25 to 35 years if you can do technicians, 75 to 115 years if you train anesthesiologists. So that kind of uncovers the deep value in, in using equipment that is less complex and easier and in intuitive is perhaps we can shorten training times. It's all the talk amongst Air anesthesia chairman right now. Can we shorten training times from you know, four years for anesthesia to three because we have an extreme provider shortage coming in the United States? So back to our evolutionary timeline, um, we're working now in a serpentine tracheal access world with video laryngoscopy. We have half a solution and we we've, we've now have a tracheal access gap. So dynamic introducers, um, I was not the first to uh, discover combined technique or to use it. There was other people that were using it across the world. Um, John Doyle is, is the first to publish on it. Um, and it, but starting to use fiber optic bronchoscopes for tracheal access, um, along with video laryngoscopes. And my company is bringing uh, a single operator um, tool that, that can provide dynamic access to markets. So about 2014 is when those started to pop up in our literature. Um, originally, they popped up as teaching tools. You would put the video laryngoscope in, have the resident drive the fiber optic. When they got lost, they could look at the video laryngoscope screen and see where they were. And so it was really a teaching tool to teach fiber optics. Um, that's how I was using it before I went to Africa. And that's the only reason I thought of it when I was there and in that pinch. Um, so combined technique, VL for visualization, great view, fiber optic bronchoscope for dynamic introducer. Um, dynamic um, introducers, key common features, they've got to have a dynamic tip that has full anterior and posterior articulation, controlled by a handle, um, and that allows steering of the introducer. They got to have a flexible shaft um, that conforms to the curves of the airway. So wherever the tip goes, the shaft can follow. And I'm describing a fiber optic bronchoscope currently. And that allows you to solve the primary curve, the inflection point, and the secondary curve 
um, without trauma to the patient. So what's it look like? Anterior curve solved, inflection point solved, and then um, secondary curve solved. So now our intubation system with combined technique, visualization equipment, decreased skills, panoramic view, stable view, can be shared by others. Two operators, because a fiber optic bronchoscope takes two hands to operate, and then tracheal access is now dynamic. So that's kind of the birth of the dynamic access era, in my humble opinion, um, was the combined technique. So fortunately, we've had randomized controlled trials done with combined technique. Um, this is Rainer Leonard. He's in uh, Louisville. And he looked at um, double view combined techniques, so video laryngoscopes plus leaving the, the fiber optic scope view on. So you've got two views. Um, video laryngoscope and the fiber optic bronchoscope. And this is a randomized control prospective trial, um, rigid stylet versus the two view technique. And um, he showed that with two views, um, tracheal access, the first pass rate wasn't much better, um, but ultimately all of the patients that couldn't be intubated could be intubated with, um, with combined technique. And so they crossed over and rescued the rigid stylet patients with combined technique. And then another um, study was done in Italy by Maz Mazanari and um, combined technique. This time he used a single use or a single view combined technique. So he simply used the ambuscope as a dynamic stylet. He did not get that second view out of it. Um, so it was a blind dynamic introducer is how he described it. It's a randomized prospective trial of difficult airways. And he showed first attempt tracheal, or tracheal access um, success 67% in the rigid stylet, 91% um, with a uh, dynamic stylet. Airway injury rate dropped from 11% to 1% and time it was faster to, uh, to use a dynamic stylet. So what I just presented was the clinical outcomes, and we're going to contrast those to business outcomes in just a second. Um, so higher first pass rates with combined technique, less traumatic for the patient, and they're faster. Okay? So just made the clinical case. So does that matter to your hospital? Um, do you work in a business or a hospital or a bit of both, and then who controls your supply chain? So... Combined technique availability is limited. We don't use it very often, even though it is randomized. You know, it's, those are single center studies, so we can't say it's the ultimate evidence. But the evidence is pretty good that it's the best way to manage a uh, difficult airway if you can get a video laryngoscope in that patient's mouth. So the challenge is um, video laryngoscopes are widely available. They're durable. They're easy to use. Fiber optic scopes as dynamic introducers are fragile. They're unavailable um, immediately, and they're expensive to use. So that's the problem we have to solve to unleash the technique. So how about sustainability, sustainable ability in Rwanda? So I got started on the business not because I wanted to make a bunch of money, but because that's the way I think you can make things sustainably available in the developing world. So I can do this as a hobby, come back, um, procure or pinch or repurpose um, Ambu scopes from uh, hospitals or have them donated and then take them or send them to Rwanda and continue to have that technique available. Um, that project dies when I die. Can do this as a charity where I set it up so Ambu sends, um, sends scopes to uh, Rwanda. And um, the problem is. Uh, getting companies to donate. You can do that generally, but you get donor fatigue. The CEO of Ambu just changed three months ago. He doesn't know me. That's probably not going to be sustainable. And, and charity, in my experience, isn't a great sustainable way forward. Um, you can build a business. Build a profitable business. Profitable businesses um, are sustainable. And that's the most sustainable way. Um, that's the way our world works currently. So, What's the drive for doing these things? Academic approach is intellectual drive, right? That's what drives academics. We study it, we tinker with it, 
um, is that a hobby? If it doesn't have sustainable impact at scale, is that a hobby or is that something we do for society that improves society? So social justice approach, um, these are emotional drives. You know, I want to do the right thing. Great. Is it sustainable? Um, that's generally what drives the charity approach. Profit approach, economic drive, make it a business. Businesses are sustainable and they become self-sustaining. They, they live way beyond, uh, GE is still around and I believe Thomas Edison is dead. So now the question becomes, can you make a business of it? Um, the first and primary thing is what's your return on capital? So businesses take capital to get started. So there's gotta be a return on that capital. People don't give you money in the business setting unless they think they're gonna get more money back. And then what's the rate of profit or how much money are they gonna be back? Because capital, you're competing against now a treasury bond that'll get you 4% with very little, um, very little risk. And so you're competing with software companies, everything else out there, that's a whole nother lecture as to why that has made, you know, how that affects, um, affects innovation in medicine and why we aren't getting the new tools we need. Okay, so why is pediatrics always last? Right, everybody loves children, nobody wants to see a, children, a child harmed, but Glidescope, I believe, just came out with their pediatric blades maybe five years ago. I don't know, is there any pediatric people here? Why is that? That's a mystery. So um, I'm gonna take you through building a pediatric um, difficult airway company. So to get any product to market at scale is a minimum $5 million investment. Okay, there's 2 million pediatric intubations done a, a year. 2% are difficult. That's 40,000 intubations a year. So that's your, the number of, of intubations you can participate in as a company, building a difficult airway tool. So venture capital wants 10 times their money back and they want it back in three to five years. Remember, you're competing against tech companies that can either make a billion dollars in five years or they fail in five years. And that's what venture capital wants. They don't want an extended marriage. They want everything to be consummated in five years and either everybody's a, a successful or we're moving on to the next business. And that's just the nature of the way capital works. So takes 5 million in capital. They want to see 10 X returns. So that means whatever you build needs to pay them back $50 million to the investors. Exit multiples of revenue. So you need to develop a revenue stream and then they about four times that revenue stream is what the company will sell for. So that means you need to have a revenue stream of 12.5 or yeah, 12.5 million dollars per year at the end of five years for them to think about investing. And that's what you're trying to convince them you can do. So in about five years, you might be able to get to 10% market saturation. The adoption curve for new technology in medicine is about 17 years. That's how long it took from the LMA to go from, that's a crazy thing, I'm gonna, who's gonna stick that where? And everybody's gonna aspirate and die to we use them routinely. About 17 years and that's about the average lifespan of a practicing um, high impact at academic. So you can ask whether we're changing our practices or whether we're just dead man shoes, people retire and a new generation comes. We're not good at adopting new technology. The video laryngoscope is out for 20 years now, 20 plus, um, and we're, it's really just becoming accepted for routine use and first, um, you know, first attempt, like nobody bothers you if you say, eh, I'm just going to use it all the time. You know, you might still get bothered with that. Um, so 10% of the market is only 4,000 intubations per year. So each device in this case must cost, we're gonna take $12 million to make it easy and divide it by 4,000 intubations. That means that device has to cost $3,000 a piece to fund that company with venture capital. 
Does that make sense to people? So when you ask a company, are you going to produce me a pediatric device, um, you know, they're going to not say it, but you're going to say, who's going to pay for that? How am I going to pay my investors back? So funding, you got to think about how are you going to fund this company? What are the expectations on return of investment? So how are you going to get the capital to start the company? So charity options, they're out there. Um, foundations don't want any money back. They'll just give you money. Those are rare, rare, rare birds. SBIR funding, NIH funding, these are essentially charities. They don't expect returns on that. Um, Congress does, but the NIH does not. So hobby options, you can pay for it yourself and you get your friends and family. Um, they'll do it for because they love you and they want to see you be successful. And they'll have some bragging rights if they are successful. But if you don't, um, if you don't return your money to them, um, there'll be a hard, you know, people will feel bad for about six months and then everybody moves on. So capital options, how about capital? You can get angel investors. These are wealthy people who like to dabble in the market, and they'll give you um, two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to play around with. They expect um, somewhere between five and eight x. So you might be able to get that pediatric company built with a uh, if everything goes right, and you can do it in five years and get to ten percent of the market. You might be able to do it if you produce devices that are um, that are. $1,200 or $1,500. So venture capital, we went through that 10 to 20x return. So venture capital doesn't work very well for, um, for uh, medical devices. Private equity. Private equity buys companies once they're companies, once they're producing revenue. Um, so they're a different beast, but they expect three to five um, x returns. But they, your company has to be profitable before they will touch you. Okay, and then internal funding. So internal funding is once a company is developing its own capital, then they can actually deploy that capital to um, develop new tools. It generally takes five to 10 years for a company to become profitable, and then they can think about adding on the pediatric devices because they then know the market, and they'll accept a 1.5 to a 4x return. And so Glidescope had to become very profitable and enough of that profit had to be able to be redeployed to pediatrics to um, get those devices available. So that's why PEDS is last. It is a capital problem and a business problem, not a clinical problem. Um, so who's your customer? If you're going to start a business, you have to know who your customer is. Um, I was focused on clinical outcomes when I started this business, and I was pulled aside by an exec, and he said, no, 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 no. You need to solve economic outcomes and business problems because you're selling to a business, not anesthesiologists. How many people have written a check for the, uh, the equipment they're using, besides the chairman? <laughs> um, so we are the end users, but we're not the customers. Okay, So we act in the patient's best interest. Clinical outcomes will sway us. Um, business outcomes are what's in the hospital's best interest. And this is a cold, hard fact that um, that's the world we live in. Okay, so deep value, where we went through the Rwandan numbers. So whenever we de develop a new device, we should be looking for devices that get consistent outcomes in a wider variety of pathology and they should require less training. Now, that last piece is probably another lecture in that academic anesthesiologists like to sit in front of the Starship Enterprise when they have an echo machine. But if you look and ask how many of those buttons actually have worn out letters on them, it's very few. So what are all those other features doing? Are they clinically improving patient care? Or are they just making us feel powerful? And you can ask those questions because we're running into the time where we can't, you know, if we really want our patients to do better, we have to make equipment that's less expensive and focus on clinical outcomes. So intubation business problems, long training periods, part of the reason you're training for four years is so you get the airway management experience needed to safely take care of patients. And yet, 
the most common catastrophic um, outcome in um, anesthesia is still airway management. Okay, it's expensive. Um, there has been little ability to task shift this safely to other advanced practitioners. Um, advanced airway equipment is expensive and complex. It's difficult to maintain, difficult to clean. Fiber optic bronchoscopes, $280 to $300 a use. Intubating LMAs is a high skill procedure with inconsistent outcomes. Most difficult intubations are unanticipated. We do a terrible job at predicting who's going to be a, do, a difficult intubation. Okay, and these cause delays. Emergency equipment has to be deployed. Um, multiple providers are often in the room. So that's very expensive from a business and a workflow standpoint. So strategic business value, if you can shorten training periods, shift things to advanced practitioners so that we're not intubating in ICUs, we're not backing up the EDs, and we're... Um, we're not having death and destruction in the pre-hospital space. That's valuable. Um, hospitalists, EMS, infrequent intubators. Um, predictable outcomes. Think about an ambulatory surgery center. When we struggle with an airway there and we wake somebody up, that's $6,000 that never um, gets billed for because the surgery doesn't take place. And that patient can really never go back to a surgery center. So that's a very expensive um, airway that... Uh, that costs a lot of money. The number one reason at the University of Utah, when I screen patients at our surgery center, if I'm concerned about their airway, they don't even get a chance to access that surgery center. Lower equipment costs, um, if, you know, equipment that costs less than fiber optic bronx and deployment of a video of a uh, difficult airway cart is um, valuable to the hospital. So value to the provider, you got to have value to everybody that's going to use the device. Precision navigation into the trachea, again, the chances, I think, 10 or 15 years from now of not having a dynamic tool in our hands, whether it's mine or somebody else's, is pretty low. Um, surgeons have precision tools for laparoscopic surgery and indirect um, visualization. Why don't we? Okay, self-rescue when struggling. If you can solve the problem yourself before it becomes a catastrophe or a crisis, that's always good. Um, immediate availability saves time and face. Um, reduced number of intubation attempts. Easy to use, less stressful for difficult intubations. So these are the kind of things, if you're starting an int a, a company, you got to think about, you know, can I actually prove these things? Can I actually, uh, uh, you know, complete my value proposition? So tactical um, business value workflow, single use, extremely portable, no cleanup. Another day we can talk about why everything's single use. Um, fewer fiber optic scopes used, uh, less calls for assistance, you know, fewer emergency airway cart deployments, fewer crikes. So consistent outcomes, wider variety of pathology, less training. Um, these scopes are much, this is, combined technique is a much faster and consistent way to, to intubate people in the OR. Um, this is unpublished data. Uh, and again, I'm not here to go through data as much as um, if you've used a combined technique, it's pretty simple. Okay, wider variety of pathology. Um, this is a patient with a fully fused neck, and I'll show her, I won't show her. But she was intubated um, very quickly with uh, combined technique. Um, We've done, we published data with rescue series after failed VL and failed DL. How do you do with a uh, combined technique? 97% um, first or uh, ultimate success rate, 94% first pass rate. And that's in comparison to the other techniques um, studied. So can be used for nasal intubation. Combined technique works fantastic for nasal intubation. Big panoramic view, no McGill's. No manipulation of the neck. Works great for awake intubations. This is a patient with a glottic tumor and uh, neck radiation, a known difficult airway. Um, video laryngoscopes, you numb people up. They work great because you're conforming to that primary curve, so there's not a lot of pressure on tissue. And then as soon as you have a dynamic stylet or a dynamic introducer, and you're not forcing your way through the glottis, Patients tolerate it really well. And you can see his neck isn't moved at all. Now, when we go through, we'll, he'll still cough. 
And you can accomplish this with a fiber optic bronchoscope or a single-handed, um, you know, TCI. It doesn't matter. So training to expertise, lower training set to get to visualization with the video learning scope. Anecdotally, we haven't studied this, but it is a one, two, three learning technique for a combined technique. And importantly, a single operator, so you don't need to coordinate with somebody else. In a crisis, coordination is difficult. So uh, this was for my Chinese lecture. Um, but what we've done is we've brought, with combined technique, what you end up with is bringing um, our evolutionary tree back into harmony so that we now have tools and we've always had the fiber optic, but we have tools that allow us to move through serpentine pathways, and that's consistent with the uh, with the um, with the video laryngoscope. Okay, so you can just think about uh, the cell phone has had more impact in Africa, probably positive impact for people's lives. Um, they can check what is the grain price um, on the open market. You know, get information. This was not, cell phones were not developed as a charity. They were developed as a business and through scale you drive down prices and it's sustainably available. So um, that's the project is can you make safe airway management sustainably available throughout the world? Um, and I think you do it as a business, not as a hobby or a charity. So um, questions? I got one unless there's Sir. Something in the chat box. Nothing on the chat yet. So you said something that that perked my ears and in 30 seconds or so. Why is everything single use? It seems crazy. Okay. Yeah, um, it's because as a business, the most expensive part of your business is the humans. And um and so the more things need to be touched and handled, if you've got to take a fiber optic bronchoscope to a metavator, clean it for 20 minutes and then um, take it out of the metavator. You need a metavator. You need a human that's going to be distracted by that, so more anesthesia technicians. Somebody needs to set that up. They need to wipe it down, and that's all very expensive. And so it's a workflow issue and a human, um, uh, just a human resource cost issue. And so that's why they want single-use and out. Now, it's been framed as a, uh, a sterilization issue that we don't, we don't um, clean fiber optic scopes and equipment well, which we probably don't, but um, you know, probably doesn't make that much of a difference um, in that the human airway is a pretty filthy thing anyway, and things can be cleaned, but it's the time and the handling that is expensive. And so with a AMBU scope or a you know, disposable fiber optic scope, that's less technicians that are needed to set it up, take it down, and get rid of it. It doesn't need to go anywhere. Does that make sense? So when I originally uh, designed this, I was thinking reusable because I wanted it to be sustainably available in Rwanda, and um, reuse is the way to go. Um, the American companies that I, I mean, when I asked the supply chain, they were like, don't make it reusable. We won't buy it. Um, and so you're kind of a slave to your customer there. Now it is designed so that it is seamless. It can be wiped down with alcohol and uh, cleaned. And I'm not recommending this, but you know, here it is. Whatever it costs here, it'll be used a hundred times in Rwanda, and then um, it's a hundred of the cost. And so you can do some value transfer by designing products that are easy to clean, knowing they will be reused in the developing world. And then you're kind of tricking the developed world to pay for um, for use in the developing world, if that makes sense. Um, I, the question, I really love this, but one of the questions I have is that if an anesthesiologist on average, let's just throw out a number like say makes 400,000 a year, if you're starting a company, you're going to take a big salary hit. When you're Correct. Starting it. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take a lot of time to get to the point where you're generating. Correct. With everything going well. And how much do you think that that is impacting the speed of um, innovation in our specialty, especially like. Um, I think it's a huge impact. Um, 
So I am pointing out all the reasons to do this, that, that it must be a business to be sustainable from my individual, just the calculation you do. This makes no sense at all to do this for business purposes for me pur purposely. And so you've got to have something driving you beyond the profit motive for anesthesia because it is always a more consistent, predictable, and bigger income to just keep practicing anesthesia. And this is a huge reason why we don't have the tools we need because we understand the ecosystem we work in intimately, right? We, nobody needs to teach us about it. You guys are learning our ecosystem, our workflow, um, all of those nuances we understand those intuitively as physicians and as anesthesiologists. And this is why I really think that it's important to have anesthesia entrepreneurs to bridge that gap because when business and engineers build us things, they don't have that intuitive understanding and they will get it wrong more often than not. You know, build something and you'll be like, that's great, but it, my workspace is like, mm, I mean, look at Epic and look at the, the workspace that creates around us. That was not designed by anesthesiologists, right? We have bolted on some pieces to it, but nobody would design, as an anesthesiologist, you would never design Epic um, or an uh, electronic medical record with the screens and the cords and the distractions in the OR. And so that's an example of, of us not being involved at the very basic level of the initial design. And once you get the initial kind of footprint wrong, it's very difficult to fix it. And it's very expensive capital wise. And so we've got to be involved in the very beginnings. And unfortunately business, uh, the medical device companies really don't, um, don't develop things internally anymore. They develop them through uh, acquisition model because they, don't, they aren't very good at it. So the closer you are to intimacy with the ecosystem, the more likely you are to actually solve the problems that are real problems for you. Does that make sense? But it makes no sense at all to do this um, because you think you're going to get rich because, yeah, <laughs> it's not a very consistent, might as well play the lottery. Um, yeah. And I do think it contributes. Other questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Yes. Question. You come on this robotic surgery. Why does this exist if it's something that has a huge yeah. cost in the front end? Right. Lengthens the surgical time. Like, how is that a, a value to the hospital system? So I'll, I'll give you the very short answer, just in lieu of time here, but I'm happy to give you a longer answer um, after. So the short answer is it's a company that is a data company. And so every time that surgery is done, that data is collected. And in the background, um, Intuit surgery is training AI, machine vision, and they're about to solve a ton of business problems. Uh, probably the surgical notes will be written by AI. Um, there's already been a uh, laparoscopic surgery done without any human contact in the patient. There's, I think, been done one remotely where it was in a different room. Um, so data is incredibly valuable, and that is the most valuable part of that company. The second thing they did was they positioned it as a, uh, a advanced technology that became a must-have for the companies so that they could advertise and bring people in. You know as well as I do, um, probably prostates, good thing. Probably prostates, good thing. Probably prostates, good thing. Right? The training times are huge and the expense is huge. Now, the initial investment, for, I think, will improve care 15 to 20 years from now, and that investment will be realized. But, um, but you know, you're effectively making the population your uh, capital. Uh, so there, it's like Tesla. Um, Tesla, by you 